we didn't want to just hold that blessing for us. We wanted you guys to be blessed as well. And um, so I'm just going to quickly introduce you to them. This is Jeff. This is Eve. We have Bella, Elijah, Jaden, and Elizabeth. So thank you guys for welcoming them. They're going to lead us this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You guys ready to worship this morning? Come on, can we just lift our hands together and invite his presence? Jesus, we love you. We invite your presence to come and move and speak as we lift our voice. Would you inhabit the praises of your people? Come, Jesus, come. And I exalt thee. I Lift this up this morning. I exalt thee, Lord. I exalt thee. I exalt thee. Oh, we lift that up this morning.
lift your voice to Jesus, sing our voice this morning to you, worthy King. We lift our eyes to you, worthy King, the only one worthy of our worship, the only one worthy of our song. to you this morning. We look to you, King Jesus. Just take a moment right now and just lift your eyes. We remove all distraction. We fix our eyes on you, slain and worthy King. But I know there's quiet in the room, but I want you to just focus 
your eyes. If there's distraction that creeps up, just set it aside and say, Jesus, I'm fixing my eyes on you this morning. I focus my attention on you. I sing to you. Only you, slain and worthy King. Stay in history. There on the cross that made for sinners. For every curse his blood atoned. When final breath and it was finished. But not the end.
Come on, lift it up this morning. All hail the Lord of heaven and earth. All hail King Jesus. All hail the Savior of the world. The Savior of the world. We lift our eyes to the Savior of the world. The Savior of the world. The of the world. We crown him with many crowns. The Lamb upon the this morning. We crown him with many crowns. The Lamb upon the throne. We crown him with many crowns. The Lamb upon the throne. We crown you, Lord. And crown him with many
lamb upon the throne. We lift our song to only you this morning. Only you are worthy. We glorify you in this place. We honor you with our praise in this place this morning. And all God's people said, amen. He is moving. He is working. Oh, it's so good to be with you in the house of the Lord today. Beloved, good morning, good morning. Welcome to Calvary Southbury. Thank you for coming and, and being part of what's happening here, what the Lord is doing here in this place. This is a place where Jesus is made known, where people are being transformed and all are loved. I love it when you say it with me. It's awesome. <laughs> Um, so if today is your first time, boy, did you pick a great day to come. Or maybe you've been coming for a little while, but you're ready to take the next step. We'd love to get to know you more, so I invite you to come over to the Connect Center, just to the right as you walk out these doors. Fill out a Connect card. Those are also at the seat in front of you if you want to fill it out now. We just want to keep you up to date on all we have going on and coming up, because we love the community we have here, and it would be made better if you were part of it. And some of those things that I want to invite you into that I don't want you to forget that are coming up really soon is our connect groups. They start this week. Tomorrow is our first one of the fall session. Um, so if you're interested in connect groups, if you haven't signed up yet, we have all the information you need over at the Connect Center. Also a really easy way to sign up for those at the Connect Center. So come over there and find one that's going to fit you. We have so many choices books, video series, uh, going through the scripture reading, our daily scripture reading, it's great. There's different days, different times, something for everyone. Also, I want you to not forget, we have our trunk or treat coming up, but our first, our first um, ask is that you uh, sign up to decorate your car. So that sign up is closing soon. We want to make sure we have enough so that this will be a great event. So sign up for that, again, at the Connect Center, really convenient. Um, you can do it online as well, but just come over to the Connect Center, sign up. We want you to sign up by Friday, so you only have a few days left of that. And then also don't forget, we have our women's retreat, our one-day mini-retreat called Becoming a Godly Woman. That sign-up is closing on Saturday, the 14th. So again, this is your last week to sign up for that. You can do it over the Connect Center. Come over there, ask any questions you have. And then I also want to invite you back next week for our Sunday morning, but then on Sunday night is our night of worship. And I think this night of worship is going to be so great because we've learned some things from this, this worship team that was just up here um, over this weekend, and I think, you know, like God is stirring something. So don't miss it. Um, so next Sunday at 6 p.m., our night of worship here at church. So that's all from me for now, but now I get to welcome, welcome to the stage um, the wonderful uh, Brenda. <laughs> she, is, she told me how to introduce her, and I totally forgot. <laughs> so it wasn't wonderful, Brenda, but that, that's, how, that's what I think. So she's going to read our scripture for us and pray for us as well. So in preparation of reading God's word, if you're able, we'd love for you to stand. All right. We are going to be in Second Peter chapter 1, reading verses 12 through 21. And I'll try not to cry. <laughs> Sometimes the privilege of getting to be even in this place, reading this word is overwhelming. And in light of that worship and the glory and the majesty of who we serve, do you not want to just get down on your knees and on your face and cry <laughs> that he could even allow us to be here? So I brought a tissue. I'm going to try to read it. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. 
For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Lord, all glory and honor to you and you alone, the most excellent glory. And Lord, we just tremble in your presence, knowing that we are not worthy to be called your children, but for what you did, Jesus, on the cross. And we can barely fathom the implications of all this for each of us, Lord. We've barely scratched the surface of this mystery. But we stand here knowing that you will return and we will enter into that mystery and we will know how loved we are and we will understand the price that you paid. And we just anticipate that day with a great longing. So we just ask you to bless the teaching of your word today, Father, as we know that it comes from frail humans fallen and weak and not worthy apart from what you, Holy Spirit, might do in us and through us. And so all glory to you, God. And we just come expecting you to speak. In your precious name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. And here's Pastor John. Hey, thanks. Do you need water? No, I'm good. Thank you. Beautiful Brenda. I like it. it sure is. Um, hey, good to be with you all. Great, great to be with you. We're in a series called What in the World is Going On? And you've probably been asking that a lot lately. I don't know, just if you look at the news, if you've been following anything at all, you're just going like, what? What is this, right? You've got Hamas attacking Israel, and now the whole thing that's going to go back with that. And you've got these are some of our Palestinian brothers and sisters caught right in the middle of the two and they're not we're not going to hear anything about them and then we go like how are we supposed to pray how do you pray for this whole situation um Pete Gregg who does 24 7 prayer if you do Lectio um, 365 you know that name um but he posted a prayer uh, it, was, it was beautiful I, I think it was an Instagram Brenda gave it to me this morning um, and it was a great way to pray for the whole situation there. But anyway, you know, what in the world is going on? It's a summary, I think, of like, as we're in Second Peter, of, of the whole book. You know, as we're going through the book, that's a, it's a question that kind of comes up and off the pages there because the church in the first century, as Peter is arrested and Paul is arrested, they're in Roman jail, they're going to be executed. They're going like, what is this? What's going on? And it would be a question that they would be continuing to ask as they're seeing a culture that just seems to be off its hinges. And it's just going off more and more. Like when you didn't think it could go off anymore, it found another way to go off. And so they were seeing their government just increasingly corrupt. They were looking on the horizon and they were just seeing uncertainty, uncertainty all around them. And like, we just don't like uncertainty. I don't know if you've noticed that about yourself, but we don't like uncertainty. And they're thinking like, well, what's next? What's, what's going to happen? Will I lose my rights? Will I lose privileges? Will we be persecuted? Will we become outlaws in this land and, and where we live just because we love Jesus, we follow Jesus, and we love others? 
It was just uncertain, uncertainty and threats. What in the world is going on? And that's the question like, we ask, and we find ourselves asking in the midst of any hardship. And so it's a question, though, that we find followers of Jesus have asked throughout all the centuries when they find themselves in cultures and in nations that are just moving in polar opposite directions from the ways of Jesus, right? That's just what happens. And so Christians have always looked around and they go like, what is it? What's happening around me? And even today, I mean, we, we, we look around us and there's always those. I mean, you will always hear those that come along and they'll say, you know, they'll say to the church, oh, persecution's coming. You know, it's just a matter of time before they do and I don't know, whatever it is they are going to do, they fill in the blank there. But you know, like, persecution doesn't really work for followers of Jesus. I mean, all you have to do is be a little um, student of history to figure that out. I mean, history tells us, like, persecution, all it does is it spreads the faith quick, quick. They, governments try to stamp out the faith, and history tells us it's like throwing water on an oil fire right? I mean, just ask Rome. Look what happened to Rome. Ask China. Ask Iran. But I think as, I think where we look and where we stand like today, the greatest threat that's on the horizon and has been on the horizon is that the church is looking for another kingdom to be ushered in instead of the kingdom of God. See, it's a church. This is the threat. It's a church that wants to see change in culture, but the gospel's optional. In other words, in other, it's optional to that change. In other words, the greatest threat is that like, we, would just, we would lose sight of who we are, our citizenship, our identity in Jesus Christ. It's just plain and simple that we would lose Jesus in the midst of a culture going off its hinges and everything's issues. When I was um, walking across Spain on the Camino de Santiago, it was a, two months ago now, I think, at this point, I stopped these villages along the way. They're like mountaintop villages, old, like medieval ones with walls, sometimes still intact, and old buildings, small populations, but churches in them would be, would be in there, and churches from 13th century, 11th century sometimes, all Romanesque. Um, that, well, I mean, that was the architecture. So very dark inside, very dark, because windows are, create structural... Um, integrity issues and all that stuff. So, so very dark inside and, and beautiful. Like, you know, you, you feel like reverence in those places. But as you move closer to the city, you would find like wealth kind of increasing. And so from these 13th century churches, you would see altar pieces or whatever it is behind the altar, like from floor to ceiling, like just these ornate, beautiful works of art from the Renaissance periods. Like, I mean, carved, like, intricate scenes of Jesus' life and overlaid a lot of times, over t a lot of times with, with gold, with gold and stuff. And I started to understand something about creating things beautiful for beauty's sake because people are just reflecting the nature of being created in the image of God, but that's its own subject. But there were these statues of Santiago in some of the churches that you would, you would come upon. Santiago, um, St. James, St. James, or James, the Apostle James, he brought the gospel to Spain in the 30s and was killed in 44 in um, Jerusalem, beheaded in Acts and so forth. So, um, but you see statues of him. Sometimes he was... Um, you know, dressed as a pilgrim, because it's a pilgrimage route. Um, sometimes he would have the word of God and he'd be preaching. And other times, in certain areas, you would see him on a war horse with a sword, a sword in his hands, and he's trampling on moors and cutting down moors. Now, moors are, um, are Muslims from... Uh, from North Africa. So some people think they were the Berber people um, that, that have come in and mixed Islam with the national um, indigenous uh, culture stuff, religions. But anyway, basically, the Muslims have come up across from North Africa and they conquered much of the Iberian um, Peninsula, Spain, Portugal, and so forth. Charlemagne point pushed them back, I think in 700 or whatever, uniting some of the, the nations. But they pushed, pushed them back. But as I was starting to see 
these statues um, from Roman, you know, Renaissance periods and before that of, of James the Moor Slayer. I, I was looking at him and going like, how in the world did it ever come to that? The man who brought the gospel, the apostle brought the gospel to this land and like you have him as a trampling on humans, cutting them down. And then, of course, how some of that happened was, I mean, they had the threat of the Moors. They needed something to rally behind, you know, bring multiple kingdom city-states together to fight a real threat. But, they, but the real threat to them is what they were missing. See, Christianity was being hijacked and it was being abused. Um, it, was being, it was being abused to represent something that it was not. And what was lost, well, I, I should say, it worked. It worked. They were able to rally. They were able to keep the Moors from going above the Camino de Santiago kind of line there. Um, but it worked. What was lost, though, was Jesus. They had their Moor slayer. They had their conquering warrior. They had their rally point. But it wasn't Jesus. Peter, he knows in this epistle, Second Peter, he knows that like death is looming. He knows it's like right around the corner. He, he knows his government, the, the Roman Empire, it's a threat to Christianity, and there's no doubt about it. But it's not, he, he's looking at it, and it's not the threat that so many people perceive it to be, not in the same way. Like he knows that there is a greater threat out there than these followers of Jesus expect. It's not the culture, it's not the government, it's not issues, it's not out of control immorality, it's not corruption, it's not war, it's, it's, not, it's not sin, although like we are called to be live, you know, lives that are, we are to be ruthless with sin in, in our lives, like we, we can't even live in the days that we live in if we're not ruthless with sin in our lives, we won't be able to navigate it, right? But it's, that's not the threat, the threat isn't, isn't um, pestilence or out of control governments, the threat is Christians forgetting, forgetting in the midst of the grind, in the midst of the threats, in the midst of the perceived threats, in the midst of seeming like things are just getting increasingly out of control. The greatest threat is not compromise like so many think. It's compromise in the church. No, that's never been a threat to the church. Sure, I mean, there's been groups that, that go off and all this. God has always had his that won't compromise. It's like when he told Elijah, he goes, Elijah, Dude, I've got 5,000 that have never bent the knee to Baal. And so it's not, it's not Christians, you know, compromising or not holding the truth or making the truth fit the culture. No, it's, it's not the threat. It's the slow, almost undiscerned, undiscerning, letting go of him who is truth for, quote, truth because of the cares and the concerns of this world, the world that's spinning recklessly out of control. It's looking, this is the threat, it's looking at something other than the gospel of Jesus Christ to bring about change. So the apostle James became a more slayer, and it was very slow. It was almost an unperceived letting go of him who is truth. And it worked if your goal was a kingdom now. So Peter, in this short letter, he, he tells us, don't forget. I think he says it three times in this little section. Don't forget. Don't forget. So are we doing okay? It's like, it's like sitting around a campfire eating s'mores, isn't it? Like marshmallows for everybody today. Um, <laughs> But you know, like if you're living, if, if you're looking for a, a savior to the culture, if you're looking for a savior to the culture, a, a, a Messiah, a, an anointed one, a savior to the culture, to the world, to its aberrant ways, you're going to find many of them are rising up. And Jesus said, you be careful in the last days because many are going to rise up and say, here's the Christ or there he is. He said, don't go after him because it won't be the Savior. Jesus rescues people. He does not rescue cultures. Let's pick up in verse 12. Verse 12 says, for this reason I won't be negligent to remind you of, always, always, of, of these things. Though you know 
and you're established in the present truth. So the question wasn't like, is this church established in the truth? They were established. Like, and, and, and Peter, Peter's saying, he says, like, we know you're established. That was Peter's mission, so to speak, right? To establish the church in Jesus Christ. Remember before um, Peter fell, before he denied the Lord three times, Jesus told him, hey, you're gonna deny me three times. And Peter said, me, Jesus, you know, all the other guys, all the other bozos, they'll deny you through, they'll deny you, but I, I'm Peter, I'm the rock, I'm going to stand, and, Pe and Jesus was like, yeah, yeah, Peter, after you've returned, after you've failed, after you've sinned and planted your face firmly in the ground, after you have returned, after you've repented, right, strengthen your brethren, establish, that's the word, establish, and Peter took him seriously. He knew. He knew Jesus wasn't creating a metaphor for him. He knew Jesus was saying, establish my church. And so after Jesus rose from the dead, he restores Peter three times. And you remember, you know, Jesus walking with him by the Sea of Galilee, John chapter 21. He says, Peter, do you love me more than these? And Peter says, you know, Lord, that I love you. And Jesus responds back with an action. Feed my lambs. And three times they go through this scenario and Jesus says, feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. Peter took that charge very seriously and he could get to the spot of where he was looking at the end of his life, looking at what's coming and he says, you're established. That's not the question at hand. The question is, would they fight to remember? See, because if you haven't noticed, we have this incredible capacity within us to forget. Have you ever been talking to somebody? Like, you know them. You've known them for years. You're talking to them. You've got another friend next to you, and you want to introduce them to them, and you guys are kind of going back and forth, and you're just about to introduce them, and you go, oh, I forgot their name. <laughs> right? Has that happened to you? It's coming. It's coming. It's, yeah, it's coming. There it is. It really is coming. Um, but it, it is, it's, it's, it's coming. It's just, it's just a matter of time. Remember it. Might have to change this out. Okay, we're good. We're good. I just won't move. And tie my hands behind my back. I won't be able to talk either. <laughs> um, <laughs> But anyway, uh, you know, the day in, day out, though, with all the distractions around us, with all the relentless anxiety um, that this culture has created and that we swim in, we don't even know, we're like a fish swimming in the water, we don't know we're wet. We're just in this ambient anxiety all the time. Um, it grates at the very core of our beings. I mean, we have temptations that are not just at the tip of our fingertips, right? I mean, that's, that's not the way, I mean, it is that there, but it's beyond that. Our, our, the way the internet works, the way our phones work, I mean, it's just constantly pulling at us in the most subtle and cunning ways to get us to, to fall in, in the midst of it. But in, in all of that, it's not the culture that's the concern to be the concern of its eroding. It, like, it has to. Jesus told us that's the way it's going to be. But that's not the concern of the culture eroding. The concern is your faith, or your ability to see, your ability to know like, like who I am and to where I belong. It's, it's the erosion of your identity. Like that's, the, that's what Peter's concerned about here. It's the erosion of like, I know where my home is. It's the erosion of the power of the gospel to save and transform lives and to know and to remember that. Like that's the real threat. I don't know like how many people in the church have actually lost the gospel when they think they're holding on to it. They don't believe the power of it. But isn't this what Peter's referring back to when he says, for this reason, for what reason? Well, to go back to verse 11, he says, he says um, for so an entrance will be supplied to you um, abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Like you have a home. You have a home in the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You have a destiny. Like you're on a pilgrimage right now. And yeah, you're going through this place that's not your home. You're going to this place that is your home. 
And there's characteristics, he told us, of this home that we're to be growing in. And we saw that last week as we're to be growing in our relationship um, in, with Jesus Christ, in our relationship yeah, with him. And the week before that, we saw about how we're to be growing in our intimate knowledge of him, not just knowing things about him, but intimate knowledge. And so Peter says, I'm not going to be negligent to remind you of the realness of reality. You're never going to hear too much about Jesus Christ, him crucified and risen from the dead, that he alone has the power to set one free. You're not going to hear too much about that. You'll never meditate on that too much. You never will. You'll never hear too much about the power of the resurrection and what's been made available to us. You'll never meditate on that too much. You'll never hear too much about the need to know him and to walk with him and to grow in a knowledge of that. You'll never hear too much about the gospel alone is what saves people, right? You'll never hear too much about it, that it alone is the answer. Jesus and the gospel are the answer, right? You'll never hear too much that you have a belonging, a home, some of it you get to taste a little bit of it now and realize a small taste but the reality is coming and peter's seeing and he says oh i'm getting closer to it remember see jesus seemed to think (laughs) he seemed to think that we would need these calls to remembrances isn't that why he instituted the lord's supper communion people call it the eucharist right isn't that why he did it what it why did he, when he did it or he gave it to us what did he say it means right? he says you know take this bread it's my body broken for you do it in what remembrance of me right and the cup here take this drink this is my blood of the new covenant do it in remembrance of me we go like well i can never forget jesus you saved me see jesus seems to think that this world has a lot heavier effect on our soul than we will often give credit to. So, but I could never forget, Jesus. I could never forget. Yeah, but when you look at somebody that's stuck in aberrant ways, do you remember? Do you remember what it was like to be dead and call it alive do you remember what that felt like do you remember that a person has no power whatsoever to change anything at all about their existence in a real way that it is only the broken body of jesus christ and his blood poured out on the cross that has the power to do that see but i see too often the church forgetting and they see issues and they don't see people i see the church forgetting how and they mix up how purity is brought about so peter reminds him verse 13 he goes on he says yeah i think it's it's right as long as i'm in this tent to stir you up by reminding you so a second time he's saying remember like like i said first week peter gets it you know he's like walked with jesus for years he knows he's peace and i have him right I'm, i have peace you know i know the one whose life and i have it he and what's he calling his body at this point in time a tent Paul would use the same metaphor. It's great. It's great because it's a temporal dwelling place. Verse 14, he goes on with that uh, metaphor. He goes, "Um, knowing that shortly I must put off put off my tent just as the Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. Okay, so, and we do. We have a reminder of these things, right? Because we have 2 Peter right here. We have 1 Peter with the gospel. We have the gospel of Mark. So, so let's just... Uh, what is it? Hang on a second.
It's beautiful. Thank you, guys. I, I kind of like that noise. <laughs> it's good. It adds effect to everything. So, <laughs> so where, where were we? Oh, the tent. The tent. He's saying, I'm putting off this tent. This tent. And he left a reminder. First Peter, Second Peter, Gospel of Mark. Um, let's run down this little bunny trail for a little bit. Let's, let's talk about Peter and the death that Jesus told him about. Verse 14 again. He says, knowing shortly I must put off my tent as the Lord Jesus showed me. Um, Jesus showed Peter how he was going to die. If you recall back as we were reading through the Gospel, the gospel of John, actually right after the scene of him restoring Jesus, or, I'm sorry, Jesus restoring Peter, who was saying, do you love me? Right after that, we have this, this restoration of Peter. Right after that, Jesus tells him how he's going to die. John chapter 21, look at what it says here. Uh, most assuredly, this is Jesus saying this right after, feed my sheep, establish my church, right? He says, most assuredly, or I tell you the truth, or make sure you make note of this. I say to you that when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. And when you were old, you're gonna stretch out your hands and another is going to gird you and carry you where you don't wish. And then a the comment here, um, Jesus, John makes. He said, he spoke this, Jesus spoke this, signifying what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. It's choice time, Peter, right? It's the same for us. Jesus said, if you want to follow me, he says it's going to be, it's going to be ordinary discipleship. It's just ordinary discipleship. Luke 9, 23. You must deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. Deny yourself. Deny yourself daily. And so you will and I will every day, Jesus seems to think, and he seems to be right, like all the time. Okay, he says that every day we're going to have to say no to self. And that would be part of following him. The following him would be one of the hardest things. It will be the hardest thing that you ever do. You will be called to holiness and people will mock it. And he will just simply say, follow me. You'll be called to step out in faith and people will call you crazy. And he'll say, follow me. He doesn't say, follow me anyway. He could, he could have. He could have said, Peter, this is how you, you're going to be crucified. And you know what? You're going to do it upside down because you want to be crucified like me. You're going to be crucified. And he just, he could have said, follow me anyway, but he doesn't. Just like he doesn't say, love others anyway. Why? Because anyway doesn't fit because there isn't a comparison to anything here. It's just Jesus. John chapter 21, verse 19, Jesus made it clear how he was going to die. Now, Peter and all the disciples, they knew exactly what Jesus meant when he gave that thing in verse 20, or verse 18. He, they, you know, it wasn't like cryptic to them. Jesus was just crucified like the last week. So they remember exactly what it is. Peter's going to die a true martyr's death by crucifixion. A true mart martyr's death, right? Not like something like people use that term today in, in different religions and stuff. He's going to be killed because he loves Jesus and loves others. And he's looking at that. So he's writing Second Peter. Now, how does he relate this to the church? Does he say, well, you know, Jesus told me I was going to be crucified and all of that. No, no, he says something much different. He says this. He said, look at, look at it again. He says, no, surely I must put off my tent. I must strike camp. I got to take off my tent. You know, strike camp is when you take down your tents and you move to a different location. It's kind of like the Bedouins do in Israel. Like today, they still live in tents in different communities there. When a pasture is used up and you, you can't support your livestock anymore, you strike camp because you're going to move to a better place. Peter says, it's almost time for me to strike camp. Verse 11 because I, this, I have this kingdom. I'm part of this kingdom. We've got, we get to taste parts of it even now. Like we get, to, we get to be in these places like in the midst of worship where we get to enjoy the kingdom and we're enjoying with like this, this bliss. But like Peter's like, man, but we are like kids playing in a sandbox. He's like, I see it. And it's coming. And it's reality is beginning to swallow up this existence. But before I enter into that, Peter says, I want to remind you his kingdom is coming. I want to remind you that like Jesus is just so 
good even when this world isn't. I want to remind you that Jesus is the answer. Even in the midst of all your frustration, he still is. Verse 16, he goes on, he says, knowing that shortly I must put off this tent, verse 16, oh, got to move my glasses, um, for we didn't follow cunning devised fables when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. It's Peter saying, look, I saw, I heard, I related it to you. I made sure that you had eyewitness accounts of his majesty. You know, there's people that will come along that they don't understand, you know, or don't want to understand. And they'll go, oh, you know, these stories of Jesus, they're sort of like Arthurian legends. And, you know, they kind of expand over time. They get elaborated on. But there's an essence of truth behind it. And all that. Peter's like, no, 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 no. I know exactly what you're talking about. I saw. I heard. I put the pen to paper, at least described it. Okay, I put the pen to the paper. We're going to look at inspiration of Scripture in a few weeks. Um, not today. We don't have time for that. But what it means, inspiration of Scripture, what it means for people to be carried by the Holy Spirit, that the Word of God's without error, the infallibility of God's Word, how it's put together. But not now. Um, but for today, Peter said, like, we made known to you these things that we saw and we heard, and now he tells us one account of his majesty, verse 17. He says, for he received from God the Father honor and glory when a voice came um, to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. So this is the Mount Transfiguration. So if you remember back in the Gospels when we were reading through it as a, as a church, so we're almost done, by the way. Don't bail out on Revelation. Don't bail out on that. Just re read through it. It's like um, going to be amazing. Um, but if you remember as we were reading through the accounts, you might have came upon a passage like this in, in Matthew um, before it said Jesus gave this prophecy. Assuredly, I say to you, speaking to his disciples, there are some standing here who shall not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. I remember reading that as a young believer going like, well, I'm still here. They're all dead. You, you know, like, well, they didn't get to see it, Lord. Like, did you give it, like, I mean, I know, Jesus, you're right, but, like, I don't understand how you're right because this seems awful wrong. Um, and there's, like, one of those things where the Holy Spirit's like, read the next verse. <laughs> the next verse says this, after six days, oh, okay, six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. Verse 2, and he was transfigured before them, his face shone like the sun. He looks a lot like that in Revelation too. Shown like the sun, his clothes became white like light. And Peter's telling us here, I saw him. I saw him in his glory. I saw his majesty. I saw it. And so verse, um, verse 18, he says this. He says, and we heard his voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. We heard the Father's voice. I wonder, like, I don't, I don't know, like, I meditate on these things, but I wonder if that voice, like, echoed in Peter's being throughout his entire life. Do you know, I, like, like, I heard God the Father speak. Like, did that just, like, stick? there like like you know i mean like you know we we, we have you know we can hear god god you know we have, we have prophecy god told me this or god said this or whatever and all that like we don't hold prophecy in contempt right um but there is this time like where there is this sweetness and the beauty of where um and where some people you know um some people have right where they hear like god's voice but hear it in a way that these ears like they, they don't come close to reckoning what that was. Like, I met um, with him who was beautiful. And it leaves one a little bit homesick. And I wonder, I wonder if Peter, in the space of writing this, was going like, and he's saying, I'm going to put off the tent soon, and he's looking at that and going like, I'm getting closer to hearing that beauty, like the beauty once again. But anyway, that's a little meditation I don't have on that. Verse 19, um, and so we have the prophetic word confirmed 
which you would do well to heed, like a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your, in your heart. Now, let me throw this out to you. This first part of this is hard to translate. It's, it's kind of awkward in, in the original language in Greek. And so it says, so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which some would, take, would do well to take heed of, okay? Let's just talk about that for a minute. Um, some people look at that and they go like, well, what this is, what this is saying, and it's a way of translating it, um, is that as great as our experiences are, we have the more sure word of God. So it's kind of contrasting experiences to the word of God. And, and, and that's true, you know, as great as our experiences are, the word of God's more sure, right? Um, and as wonderful as like what we can experience with Jesus or, or whatever, it's like God's word like trumps it. And if, if God's word, if it's in contradiction to God's word, then you have to back up and go like, okay, well, my experience, I've got to kind of get that in because something's off here. I mean, Peter made sure we knew of this in 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, when he quoted from Isaiah. He said, um, all flesh is as grass, and the glory of man is as a flower of the grass. The grass withers, the, the flower falls away, but the, but the word of God is going to endure forever. The word of God's going to remain. Your experience is like, like life, it's going, to, it's going to fade, but God's word's going to be there. Um, another way of translating this and uh, other translations do this, is the word of God is confirmed by what was experienced. In other words, Peter's saying, Peter's saying the Old Testament scriptures were confirmed by the things that we saw in Jesus. They all predicted Jesus. We saw him come to pass. What's important is that we grasp, because when Peter's talking about the prophetic word here, he's talking about the scriptures. There's a difference between prophetic words, prophetic prophetic utterances and prophetic message from God, right? Prophetic utterances, uh, for the most time, are, most part, are limited to time and space. They're limited to a group of people, to a particular situation. They could be forthtelling, they could be foretelling, right? Um, they're from God, but Peter's not talking about that. He's talking here about the scriptures. He's saying, like, the prophets have spoken in the past and it's they spoke God's word for all generations of all time for all people. So some people can prophesy. It's not equivalent to, like, God's word. And I know some people set up straw men. That's why I mention this, because sometimes people set up man, straw men and they'll go like, oh, you know, the, the, you're holding, like, prophecy as, as on equal levels with God's word. Or, you know, this prophecy that was uttered, it was on, or it's overlapping God's word. He's saying it's overwriting God's word. And people set up straw men in that regard. Um, no, no, um, a prophecy can just be a word from God for a particular situation, whether it be a word of encouragement, rebuke or whatever, again, we weigh it against Scripture. Biblically, let's just look at that. Um, Jesus is up on the mountain. Moses and Elijah show up on the mountain. Moses and Elijah represent the law and the prophets, right? There are two representatives of that. I mean, most people understand that, or I should say, if you've been a student of the Word, you, you'll get that over time. And so Elijah represents the, the prophets, and that's awesome. He was an awesome prophet. No one would deny that. But, like, what did he prophesy? I mean, like, we have, like, I, we have books of the Bible. Isaiah has a book of the, Jeremiah, Haggai. I mean, Nahum, Nahum got his chapter in there, right, as a prophet and, and all that. But, like, where's a lot? He's, like, the greatest, one of the greatest of the prophets. Where's his prophecies? Um, there aren't any. Why? Wasn't Elijah a prophet? Absolutely he was. He's a prophet. But his words were from God to that generation of people, particular time, particular space. They were localized. They weren't for everywhere at all time. So that's a freebie. It's about the inspiration. We'll get into that more another time. Verse 19. And so he says, um, you have this prophetic word, and it's confirmed by what we experience, which you would do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns, and the morning star rises in your, in your hearts. It says this, you would do well to heed. To heed what? To heed the scriptures. I'm going to follow this because it's beautiful. We'll try to wrap it all up here. Um, a lot of commentators go into different directions on what the morning star is. Venus or whatever. You know, and it is technically Venus. Venus is the star 
of the morning, right? When Venus is on the sky, it's saying darkness is over, the sun, the light is coming. That's Venus. Okay, so, but Peter's re- writing to, remember who he's writing to, people who he said are established already, right? So he's not talking about the gospel um, giving birth to a person. Well, that's not excluded here, right? Like, you've heard me say many times in the past, like, one day you heard Jesus Christ, him crucified and risen from the dead, and you're like, yeah, and Santa Claus comes on December 25th too, right? And then another time you're hearing the same exact thing, Jesus Christ, him crucified and risen from the dead, and all of a sudden you're going like, what's happening to me? Like, what's going on? Like, something, like, I, I don't know, like, I, like, I'm understanding something for the first time, and something is going on inside. Well, you're being birthed, the morning stars rising in your heart, you're being birthed into the kingdom of God, right? And so, beautiful, beautiful, be- beautiful stuff, being touched in the deep that you didn't even know you had a deep before, and now those words of prophecy are actually rewriting you. And we could say the morning star rose in my heart. And that's wonderful, but he's not talking about that. But it's good. It's good for some of you that could be happening right now as you're hearing these things. But he's not talking to people who are just coming to faith or even people who, who, who are new to the faith. He's talking to those who are established. And so what's he saying about the morning star rising in our hearts and we do well to heed the prophecy or the God's word until it happens. Um, and this is what I think that, that, that he's talking about here. It's like you read the word or they would hear it and it's awesome. Read the word. We're reading through the word as a, as a church body. We're almost done with the New Testament. Um, then that's great, but don't stop there. Don't stop with like, oh, you know, that was awesome. That was a really great, I thought, wow, that was, got a lot out of that one, you know, and then just carry on or, or read God's word and go like, I have no idea what that meant and just go, no, he says like, take it further. Meditate upon what you've read until something happens inside of you. I meditate on it until it begins to rewrite you. Meditate on the gospel of Jesus Christ, if you want to understand people who are trapped in a culture, meditate, because they're not an issue. People. So let's follow it through. Verse 20. He says, knowing this, that um, no prophecy of Scripture uh, is of private interpretation, and it's like no prophetic utterance here. Scripture, none of it's of private interpretation or private origin. Verse 21, for prophecy never came about by the will of man, but by holy men of God spoke as they were moved or carried along by the Holy Spirit. So he says the, the word of God here, the, the word of God, it never came about by the will of a person. It wasn't because like, they were like, oh, well, I have to give the prophecy, I'm going to prophesy, or I have the office of prophet, and I'm going to, this is just like what I do. He says, no, 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 no. what was happening with the, with the word of God is that people, people were carried along. It was just because a person was an apostle doesn't mean that everything they wrote was inspired, right? And we have like, Paul, Peter, and John, three apostles that wrote the New Testament. We don't have everybody, well, Matthew, I'm sorry, Matthew too, right? But you've got, you've got uh, eight other apostles, nine if you want to include Paul in there, but who, who, who weren't in there, right? So, um, so they probably wrote letters to the churches, but they weren't the word of God. Paul, many people think Paul wrote another letter to the Corinthians between 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. And they go, it's the lost letter of Paul. No, it's not lost. It was never the word of God. God's word is specific to a person that he is choosing at the time to be carried by the Holy Spirit to write to a people, and he is asking them to put pen to paper as they're they're carried along by the Holy Spirit for all generations. That's, That's what it's for. Okay, back up. Only God's word, those who God used to write his word, only that has the power to rewrite a person. 
Right? So you can, write, you can read a novel, it's great, a great novel, I love that, that made me cry, made me laugh, it's inspirational. So you might be reading Shakespeare, you might be like one of those people that like, you go like, he was a master. You know, I was a master indeed when I was going to school. Uh, I would love to have met him. But anyway, um, you know, you, you can read like a classic, you go like, oh, this is my favorite book, and you reread it again, and after a few times you get to know it and all that, and it can move you emotionally and all that, even put life in perspective for you, give you a new direction in life, like, oh, I got perspective perspective from this thing. Only God's word, though, has the capacity um, to become alive and to illuminate us, right? Only, only God's word, only God's word, like, has the capacity um, to wreck us and then rebuild us, right? I mean, only his word, only, only his word has the ability to rewrite the deepest parts of who we are, even the parts that we are scared of. Like he only his word can do it. Only his word can take that which we have stubbornly held on to for years and undo us. And one day, to where we're like a puddle, and he brings us to repentance. Only God's word can do that. Only God's word can do that. So remember these things. Remember them. Remember Jesus. Remember Jesus. Please don't forget, just don't forget the gospel of Jesus Christ. Like, it's it, you, not, you know, it alone has the power and the capacity to change lives. Remember Jesus. Hey, let's have the worship team come up and we will um, remember him as we sing and worship him. Let's pray. So Jesus, there's so many times when we can make it about other things and we, we can read the news and we could get irate. God, we can um, look around at things and, um, and not see the truth of things of what you are doing and what you're seeing. We want to see like you see, Jesus. Um, we want to remember what it's like to be dead and what it was like when you found us in that place, God, where we had, we called it life, but we didn't even know what life was until you brought us into life, and then we had something to compare it to. God, let us remember that when we see other people. God, let us remember that you, Jesus, had a mission when you walked on this earth, and it was to seek and to save the lost, and then you turned that mission back, you turned it over to us, and told us to go, to go into all the world, seek and to save the lost. God, may we not forget these things. Don't let us get caught up by the carriers and the worries of this life. In Jesus' name.
guys be blessed this week spend time knowing him let the morning star rise in your heart be the light that he created you to be and then allow that light to shine out of you guys have a beautiful beautiful week and thanks radiant for um, coming out all right god bless you all